shone into our hearts, Lord, the love of mankind, the incorruptible life by divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding and the preaching of thy gospel. Instead in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, the trampling under foot all desires of the flesh, we may follow a spiritual way of life, both meditating upon and doing all that is well pleasing unto thee. Amen. 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 Wisdom, stand aright, let us listen to the Holy Gospel. A psalm of David, the prophet and king, may his blessing be with us all. Amen. Hear, O daughter, and see, and incline thine ear. Forget thine own people also, and thy father's house, because the king has desired thy beauty, for he is thy Lord. Alleluia. <coughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, the reader of the Holy Gospel of Turing to St. Luke. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the man made servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Glory to our God to the ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Amen. So today's Gospel reading was the first mention of Mary in the Gospel of Luke, the willing handmaid of the Lord, betrothed to Joseph of the lineage of David and referred to as blessed amongst women. Having yesterday attended the Ethiopian service to celebrate the Feast of St Mary of Zion, I must admit the timing of this is impeccable. But as with most things associated with Mary in our church life, it has great spiritual meaning, even on the smallest level. Take today's reading, for example. She is exalted as highly favoured. This is not just a greeting, as she shows when she shows she's quite suspicious and quite worried about this. It also announces her great destiny. It tells us that her unknown destiny of bearing God inside her womb puts her above all of God's creations on the earth. The scale of this task is magnificent. We've all been asked to do things that we see as important, but for Mary, this was immense, really. She was asked to become the mother of not just the child of God, but God himself. And through accepting this offer, she becomes a true inspiration to all Christians and a central part of our life in the church, from festivals to iconography, even to our intercessions in the church. Mary is truly the woman we love above all. She's given many titles in the church, from Most Blessed, Full of Grace, Theotokos, Holy Mother, the Second, second Heavenly Tabernacle, the Fair Dove, and she's even compared by many of the church fathers to the church itself, because she guards us and cares for us and guides us through her intercessions, as the church does. The title I want to focus on today is her title as Ever Virgin, since it's one that many tend to get confused about. The status of Mary as ever virgin is a key belief to orthodoxy. It's seen in iconography of her, where she has three stars on her cloak representing her purity before, during and after the birth of Christ. In the orthodox tradition, she was known to be a temple maid, 
until she was brought to the widow of Joseph, who offered to become her guardian and betrothed. From that point, she served the, help from, she served the Lord from the house of Joseph, though ne never, never falling into sin for personal gain or that of others, because she was a servant of the Lord alone. So why do we believe this? Firstly, because it's right in the Gospel. We see Mary's response to the angel Gabriel when he announced to her that she would conceive a son. She said, how can this be, since I know not a man? Mary was no ignorant country girl. She knew where babies came from, really. She wasn't expecting God to come up with a stalk and appear with a child. She knew that she had, she, in order to conceive, she needed to know a man sexually. So we see that before Christ she had no children. But what about after? Well, you know, the question of was Christ the firstborn or the onlyborn? The main argument we see brought up about this is that James is commonly called the brother of our Lord. And we see mentions of the brothers and sisters of Christ. In today's language, it's a given that a brother or sister would share parents, or at least one parent, with their siblings. In the times of Christ, this was different and far more broad. The Coptic writer, Father Tadros Malati, says, It's well known that at that time cousins were called brothers. For they even lived under one roof in a large family. Until today, the same terms used in some, some villages in Upper Egypt, where they feel ashamed if a person, a close relative or friend, does not call them somebody who's a cousin or a friend brother. In the Aramaic language, we also see this. Many relationships referred to as brother or sister. It's also accepted through the same source as Mary's temple past that Joseph was prob most probably a widower with children. Since when Mary was brought into this house, he explains that he's an old man and already has children, so to take a young wife into his home would cause people to gossip. Of course, once he knows of the importance of this undertaking, he accepts Mary into his home. We also understand this conclusion, but, well, we are all question, why is it important? What relevance is it to our faith, whether Mary was a virgin until death, or whether she went on to have a family or not? In Joseph's time, there was a high regard and deep reverence for what is sanctified or set apart for God, or that which is used for the service of God. Sacred objects in the temple, the holy things set aside for the service of God, one does not touch these unless they are a priest, or likewise. It's like here in the church, the chalice is only touched by a bishop, a priest, or a full deacon. Some deacons and readers can touch them whilst tidying up, but only through a cloth to avoid touching them directly. So if Mary was set apart for God, as the chalice is set apart for the blood, then for her to have other children would be to defile this holy temple in which God dwelled for nine months. Or it means that, that he was not God to begin with. So Jesus being God and, virg and Mary being a virgin are inseparable beliefs. To put it simply, Mary's faithful response to the angel is the highest, highest model of obedience to God. Because the, the incarnation of God is not just the work of the Trinity, but of her faith also. So she is not only blessed because God chose her, but because she bore God and chose to obey God and trust in God firmly, knowing that her body would become this holy temple and should never be defiled. The events witnessed in the Gospel reading today, where we see Mary's choice, though of great importance in their own right, also tell a story that we've all experienced firsthand, at least once in our lives. For example, me doing this very sermon was a request I personally felt was quite impossible when I first well, undertook it. When I first received the email from the bishop asking me to present the lesson for the day, my initial response, as he probably well knows, was absolute panic. I'd never written a sermon before, and I even get stage fright in my own classroom. I would never imagine that I would be ready for such a great thing as to speak about the Mother of God to this congregation. This very thought process parallels Mary's response to the angel announcing that she will have a son. When, when she says, how can this be since I do not own a man, she's saying, I'm not ready for such a thing. You know, I, I have no idea about this. Even biology supports her case. Yet she accepts the will of God simply because she's asked. She doesn't tell the angel, wait a second, I'm not having a child anytime soon. 
She shows humility and submission to the will of God, saying, Be it unto me according to your word. With such an act of acceptance and obedience to the will of God, we see that our Lord and Saviour is brought into the world. It's Mary's willingness to serve God which brought, brings this forth. I personally could have run around and panicked for months about reading this homily. But in the end, it's important for me to understand and obey a request of the bishop as the icon of Christ as it was of Mary to obey the Lord. In short, me standing here preaching this homily is the least I could do in comparison to Mary's act. Though preaching a homily is hardly to be compared to childbirth, which, God willing, I will never experience, <laughs> experience to, the will of God is something we achieve in even the simplest task. The fact that you're all here today shows that you have the passion and humility to take time to do God's will. Throughout everybody's lives, we see things in the will of God. It may be visiting someone that's ill. It may be running, you're running basic events in the church, tidying up the church, lighting candles. It could even be something simple like bringing an house to six pack of sausage rolls to an occasion in the parish. Each of these is an example of doing God's will as Mary did. It doesn't have to be a matter of climbing a mountain for since God is God, he will never give you a task you can't do. You may doubt it in some cases that you can achieve what he expects, as I did with this, but he will always provide. That's the beautiful thing about God's love, is we can always ask for a helping hand, whether it be through the prayers and intercessions of the saints and martyrs, or by asking your local priest or somebody from the church community to help you with a daily task. It was only through the love of others in my local parish that I've had the confidence to come up here today, and only through the grace of the bishop that I am here with you. I'm sure everybody here has somebody that they're thankful for for something, somebody that God provided in their life to help them so that they can serve him properly. We all go through times such as these where we're asked to do something which is seemingly impossible, whether it's reading a homily or something which one of you has done in your lives. But we know to put our trust in God and the intercession of his saints. I will leave you on this note with the words of the angel that the angel said to Mary when she, when she questioned the possibility of having a child. The angel said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. So whatever you face in life, approach it with these words at heart, and in doing God's will, you will be emulating the act of Mary in accepting God's will and the continual cycle of events which brought Christ's coming into the earth. Mary's intercessions and her prayers on our behalf are a vital part of our faith, and the memory of her willingness to do the will of God is inspirational. With prayers and inspiration, we can never stray.